Now we do terrify you as to the external dangers that are trying to invade your children's space, your children's safety, mainly through what's on the internet. I'm more of a what is the internet and the tools doing to your children internally. So um, it's not about the predators out there, it's not about the sexploitations, it's about what is going on. And that, that's the emphasis of mine. Now, <clears throat> I was never intending on doing this when I got started. This is not what I had in mind when I started my medical career. How did, I got here through a very interesting turn of events. So I, I did from uh, 2005 to 2007, I did my general pediatric residency, so a lot of the general pediatric medicine out there. Then from 2007 to 2010, I went and did my general pediatric neurology fellowship. And I learned about epilepsy and muscular dystrophy and myopathies and autoimmune disorders, et cetera, et cetera. And during that, those three years, I saw the general neurology and I got very good with all of the neurology medications and treatments. And then I decided I wanted to do neurotrauma and pediatric critical care. And I did a, a, in 2010, I did a one year fellowship, and from 2010 until 2015, 16, I was uh, the sole director of the pediatric neurotrauma and criti neurocritical care at Phoenix Children's Hospital. Um, and so I disappeared from general neurology. For seven years of my life, I, I lived in the ICU. I didn't care what was going on in the day-to-day -day because the patients that I took care of could die today or they could die tomorrow. It was, you had to be there and you had to worry about them now. All of the epilepsies, all of the muscular dystrophies, all of that was really not what I did. But as you can imagine, that's a, that's a young person's game. And by the time the third child came, I had to make a decision. Like, do I live in the ICU or do I go back and, and, and emphasize more on my families? Because I could not do both. So I, I came back to Boise. I got a great job. Um, but I was back in the general neurology realm, something I'd been absent of for six or seven years. And I was shocked because in those years that I was gone, it seemed like everything had changed. My first, second, and third patient, 11, 12, and 13 year olds, I'm looking at their medication lists and I'm seeing Zoloft and Wellbutrin and Abilify and Trazodone and Zyprexa and all of these adult antipsychotics and antidepressants that were completely foreign to me in the seven years preceding that time. These were not medications that I was familiar with, that I had to deal with, because from 2005 to 2010, when I was doing my general pediatric things, kids were not on them. And the kids that were on them were seen by the subspecialists. But it seemed like every third kid was on two, three, four of these, these, these medications that were meant for severe mental health issues. And at first I felt underqualified because I didn't know these medications and I didn't know how my seizure <laughs> medicines or my dystrophy medicines were going to interact with them. And, and I just had to scratch my head, what is going on? Well, let's think about the time frame. I disappeared from general neurology in 2009. Facebook showed up in 2008. Uh, by 2011, I think they said 50% of kids had smartphones. By 2013, it was 80%. And I started thinking, maybe there's something there. And the more I've been doing this, the more I've been doing this, the more I'm convinced that there's something there. And it breaks my heart to see a 13-year-old come in on a medication list that my grandfather in his end-stage dementia wasn't even on. I'm like, we've got to do something about this. So that lit the fire under me, and so now here I am. Um, from neurotrauma to now uh, social media. Um, so I, I wanted to talk about, about what, what the quantifiable objective data is actually showing now that we've had this amount of social media, this amount of video gaming, and this amount of extreme digital age. What is it actually doing to the pediatric and adolescent brain? Okay. So the goals for the evening, we are, we are actually going to do a little neuroanatomy fun. 
which is I'm sure what everybody wanted to do when they came here tonight. Um, and we're going to talk about some of the critical emotional and behavioral structures of the brain. Um, there's, a, there's this fire to acquire mechanism that, is, that starts to become very important to the understanding of how a 10 to 18 year old brain develops. And then we're going to review peer reviewed objective studies regarding what these uh, stimuli are doing anatomically that we can actually see on brain images and brain imaging that actually change the structural anatomy of the brains of kids. Now I really try to avoid the following things. I am a firm believer that statistics never lie, but liars use statistics. And so I try to avoid anything that can be non-scientific, non-validated. I don't like to do emotional things or anecdotal stories. So everything that I'm going to try and do tonight is going to, to be very objective. So I want to start with three anecdotal stories. <laughs> um, not because I'm using this to prove my point, but because it are stories like this that got me thinking there's something powerful going on. So this, when I was in neurotrauma, was unfortunately the largest group of children that I was responsible for. This is the typical MRI of an infant who has just been fatally abused. Um, sometimes three, four, five a week would come into my service. And the story was almost always the same. The story was a five or six month old. The mom would leave the, the infant in either a stepfather or boyfriend's um, care while she went to her shift work or somewhere else and when she came back then suddenly the six-year-old somehow jumped off the couch and hit the floor and hit his head and was uh, was unresponsive that was the story that she got the injury is always the same i always saw strokes and bleeds in the exact same area you know i would get the phone call i'd pull up the image and i'd say okay um uh, let me guess the story. And the stories were always bogus. Hundreds of them um, in the six years that I did this. And uh, it, it got to be so stereotypical and so predictable that I started to notice this pattern that I would say 95% of the time it was that situation I told you about. It was the infant was left in the non biological dad's or non biological male provider's care where the bio mom was off somewhere. Three or four percent of the time was actually bio dad, and the other time it was bio mom. Now a lot of people would say, well, this could happen to anybody, right? The perpetrators that do this don't necessarily have to be sociopaths. And I would say I don't believe that, because in my years of doing this, if you're going to say it's the heat of the moment thing, then when the heat of the moment passes, somebody with a conscious should come to the doctor and say, hey, you're trying to save my, this infant's life, here's actually what happened. But that never happened. These perpetrators would hold on to their bogus story until the very last minute, even when the evidence is overwhelming that they were totally full of it. And they would never come forth and actually tell me the mechanism of injury. Every time except once. One time I met the perpetrator who was the heat of the moment. And that was this year. And this is a terrible story of a six month old girl. And dad was out of a job and he was a little bit frustrated. And the mom had to go to the grocery store. And the dad would say that from 11 to 1 was his time because he needed to recharge. And he recharged by playing Call of Duty on his Xbox. And so at 11.30, the mom put the infant down and said, I have to go to the store. Don't worry, she's asleep. You can have your call of duty. She's not going to wake up. She goes to the store 20 minutes later, when the dad is in the middle of this call of duty rush, the infant wakes up and starts crying. And he was so jacked from the call of duty that he went in and picked the little girl up, shook her, and threw her against the wall. And then, when that finally calmed down, he came to me and said, this is what I did. 
Six years, and he's the only perpetrator that ever can confess to me. And so I hear that story, and I think, number one, what a tragedy, but number two, what goes on in a father's brain where that becomes a possibility? What anatomical neurons are firing? What neurotransmitters are in control? And I, I want to learn about this from that standpoint. This is a comp, this, this one just recently happened. I am not small of stature. I think everyone can appreciate that. Um, this is not the patient's real picture. But uh, recently I had an eight or nine year old boy in my office with epilepsy. He was an otherwise neurotypical child. He had epilepsy. And I could not get his seizures under control, and I knew the gene, and I knew everything, and I could not understand why my medicines weren't working. And so I asked the long line, well, is he, is he getting concussions? No. Is he sleeping? Well, no, he's not sleeping. Why is he sleeping? Well, because he's playing video games until 4 o'clock in the morning. Well, sleep-deprived brains tend to seize more than non-sleep-deprived brains, so you've got, to, you've got to get him to sleep. She's like, well, what am I supposed to do? And I said, I, I am not prescribing you any more seizure medicine until you take away his video games and get him some sleep. And she said, okay, that's, you heard the doctor. And this eight or nine-year-old boy, maybe it was 10, I can't remember, slams down whatever was in his hand, comes charging across my room, and starts throwing for this, swinging for the fences, like he's gonna knock me out. And so I'm sitting there as I'm holding him back, and he's just doing his windmills, and I'm thinking the same thing. What is going on in his brain right now? That this 80-pound prepubescent male thinks he has a chance against this 220-pound, six-foot-three person. Like what, what is going on? What neurotransmitters are finding? What neuroanatomical structures are going on? So finally, I'm going to go back. About three years ago, what, so another common cohort, another common group in my office are the Tourette's. And we've had Tourette's for a long time. Tourette's is described in Greek, architect, in Greek mythology and Greek, Greek history. A lot of famous people have had Tourette's. Um, and Tourette's has been a very predictable disorder. It's got a 5 to 1 boy to girl ratio. It almost always starts to show subtle signs around five or six years old. It, it gets worse and the ticks get worse and sometimes they're motor ticks. Sometimes they turn verbal ticks. They almost never become violent or obscene. And, um, and they usually peak by about 12 or 13 and then start getting, start getting better, the ticks do. So a couple of years ago, in my office, I get this 14-year-old female who went to bed normal one night and then the next morning woke up with explosive Tourette's. And not just Tourette's, she's hitting herself. She's, she's running into walls. She's smashing tomatoes on her head in the grocery store. She's just flailing around. And I'm like, there's something, there's something. Yeah, this is gonna make me famous. I'm gonna diagnose this, this is gonna make me famous. So I admit her, and I had an MRI her, and I spinal tap her, and I EEG her, and I run all sorts of life, and everything comes back normal. And I, I use all the Tourette's medications I have. Nothing works. And I finally scratch my head, like, I don't know. And then two days later, another one comes in. And then three days later, another one comes in. And within a month, we have so many of these teenage girls that have this explosive onset Tourette's that's completely disabling them. We have to hire a nurse practitioner, a CMO. And we connect with Michigan, and we connect with UCLA. And they say, we're all seeing the same thing. Has anybody heard of this? So it turns out that one thing that all these girls have in common is excessive social media use. And it all started with a girl who claimed she had Tourette's, got like 3 million TikTok followers, and sub the subconscious empathy that they felt for her transmitted to them, and they took on her ter Tourette's. And it spread and spread and spread. And it was a functional psychological disorder and all of them, or almost all of them, have been linked back to excessive TikTok viewing. So again, I ask myself, what is going on in this brain? What circuits are firing? What, neuro, what, what is doing it? Because these girls are, their lives are being ruined. They're not doing it on purpose. It is a subconscious circuit. So th this is doing something to our kids' brain. 
So that's what we want to talk about. So here's your neuroanatomy. You've got to understand two key players. There's two families. There's a part of the brain called the limbic system, and there's a part of the brain called the prefrontals. And they, they are very important to each other, and at the same time, they're polar opposite of each other. So the limbic system is a very primitive system. Um, it, it, it is not much more eloquent in our brain than it is in a shark's brain or a tadpole's brain. It, it's, it's been around for million, millions of years, um, very, very simple in its structure, and it serves to do what I call the four X. It likes to fight, it likes to feed, it likes to fornicate, and it likes to promote fear. So the limbic system's job is basically to keep self-preservation and species preservation alive. If you need to fight, your limbic system is going to get you jacked up. If you need to run away, your limbic system is going to get you to run away. If you need to procreate, your limbic system is going to make you attracted to the person you want to procreate with. If you need to eat, that, that's your limbic system. Very primitive for us, right? Whereas the prefrontals, those are called the executive part of the brain. The prefrontals are involved in everything that makes us higher cognitively than the rest of the animal kingdom. That's where we get our reasoning, our problems um, solving, our empathy, our impulse control. All of those things that you see over there comes from your prefrontal cortex. There's an interesting thing about the prefrontal cortex. It's that it's the purple part of it. It represents 33% of our brain. On a relative scale, the human being's three prefrontal cortex is three times larger than any other animal. So if you look at the other primates, if you look at primates and you look at their brain, the blue and the yellow and the turquoise in the back, almost identical. But our prefrontal cortex is three times the size. It's the prefrontal cortex that, that everybody who studies this feels is what makes the human beings capable of doing what human beings can do. It is, it, 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 it represents the highest level of all complex brain areas. It's more complicated, it has more connections, it has its own set of, of neurons that are not present in other parts of the brain, and it is in constant communication with the limbic system. So here's the thing about the prefrontal cortex. It lies dormant until about 10 or 11 years old, until it starts to mature. Then it slowly starts to mature, and it's only about 50% mature by the time you're 18, and it's not fully mature until about, you're about 25 or 26 years old. So what does it mean um, when the prefrontal cortex matures? We'll be looking at So we'll get to that soon. So here's how we understand the prefrontal cortex. is a, is a man named Phineas Gage, and he's the most famous railroad worker in neurosurgical and neurological history. So Phineas Gage was an exceptional railroad worker. He was foreman, he was a father, he was a churchgoer, he was dependable. Everybody said, if you need something done, you call Phineas. And then one day, um, Phineas gets a massive spike shoved up his eyeball, where that red thing is. Um, and that's his actual skull. And it obliterates his left prefrontal cortex. He survived with was what looked like apparently no neurological deficits. When they removed that, that, uh, that railroad pole, they were expecting him to have severe weakness and blindness, and he woke up and he could talk and he could walk and he could run, he could skip, he could do everything. He, he lost that eye, obviously, but they were saying, how is this possible? But he became irreverent, profane, irritable, and unable to sit to any task. That pre the loss of that prefrontal cortex made it impossible for him to function in a civilized situation. Uh, and so that's when we really started to understand hey, there's this part of the brain that might not control movement, it might not control coordination, it might not control speech, but it is critical to control emotions concentration, focus, and things like that. So here's the problem. Um, any Star Trekkies in here? Everybody know Captain Kirk and Spock, right? So Captain Kirk is your limbic system. He, there's an adventure, he'll fly off and do it. There's a fight, he'll go off and fight it. There's an alien woman, he'll go off and date her. 
in a second, right? <laughs> uh, whereas Spock, everything to him was what Captain meant is illogical, and logic says much of that. So the problem is, is that the limbic system is the first and fastest to develop in kids. And so you get this critical time from about 2 to 18 where the limbic system is disproportionately in charge of the brain. And the prefrontal cortex is just trying to catch up. They're already at a loss. And so that leads to this, uh, this susceptibility of this, of this uh, phenomenon that we call the amygdala hijack. So the amygdala is, is probably the main center of the limbic system. What's supposed to happen, if everybody can see this, is that the limbic system and the amygdala sends a message to the prefrontal cortex, which I say is pretty insane. Hey, I want to fight this guy. The prefrontal cortex is supposed to say, not worth it. Okay? And then the story's over. Now, when the, uh, when the limbic system is, um, is not in control, it does have this sneaky secondary loop where it goes back and it has the ability to inhibit the prefrontal cortex's inhibition of itself. I don't know if I made that clear of what that means. But the prefrontal cortex, if it's healthy and in control, can, can tell the limbic system, I'm in charge. But the limbic system has this sneaky side circuit where it's always trying to chip away at that signal and inhibit it so that it can take control. Now, if you take that same two parts of the brain and you start with an amygdala that is already way out of proportionally um, activated, whether it's because of sleep deprivation, of anger, uh, cocaine, ecstasy, um, road rage, whatever, but let's say your limbic system is just on fire and your prefrontal cortex is not firing very well, you get this point where the limbic system is saying, hey, I want to fight that guy. And the prefrontal cortex is saying, no, you probably shouldn't. Now the limbic system drives the control and is able to inhibit the prefrontal cortex's inhibition, and you get no cortical or cognitive control over your limbic system. And you do things that you wish you hadn't done, and people will say, who is that? Or what happened to you? And we call that the amygdala hijack. And I think everybody here who has had kids from that age um, from 7 to 8 to 15, 16, know how easy it is for the amygdala hijack to happen to them. Where you're a sweet kid, just a couple things goes wrong, and all of a sudden there's a hole in the drywall, right? Um, okay, so the science. So here's the important thing. Um, this is kind of a busy slide. I will do my best to make it interesting. But then, when I say that the prefrontal cortex matures after puberty, this is what I mean. Uh, I just have a Can everybody see this over here? Mm, that's a problem. Alright, so uh, let me try to do my best to explain this. When you're... So, by the time you're 10, you have about 100, 150 million neurons in your brain. Of that, 3%, 30 to 40 percent are in the prefrontal cortex. But your prefrontal cortex um, starts out with way too many connections, something that we call dendrites, or spines. So this is an actual drawing, if you can see that, that picture, what looks like a branch right there, of what a prefrontal cortex neuron looks like. So there's one neuron, but there are hundreds of these, of what we call these dendrites. Um, and each one of those is reaching out and, and grabbing another dendrite, making a connection. So, when you're 10 years old, you have about three times the number of those dendrites as you do when you're an adult. And not only do you have three times the density of dendrites, but you have three times the neurotransmitter receptors on those dendrites as you do when you're an adult. So it is primed. It is primed to, to take in everything and to do everything and see everything and, and blah, 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 you know, that, that kind of a situation. And around 10, as these show here, these little things, around 10 you start to selectively prune those dendrites and those neurotransmitters in, in something called the selective elimination uh, process. 
So that by the time you're 25, you're left with only about a third of the dendrites and a third of the receptors. And so how, how does that pruning happen? Well, the brain decides what dendrites to eliminate and what dendrites to strengthen based on the interaction that the subject has with their environment during the prime of their learning years. So I'm going to say that again. The brain decides which dendrites to prune and which dendrites to strengthen during their interaction with their environment during the prime of their learning years. So the question has to be asked, what environment? What is going on with this pruning if the environment that they're living in is five, six, seven hours a day of hyper-stimulatory, super-physiologic, artificial, digital stimuli? If the pruning is dependent on the environment, and that is the environment that is dictating the pruning, then there's got to be something that we can see that's going on. And indeed there is. Um, we just talked about that. Okay. So, uh, yeah, this is the summary. Um, I don't know if I need to beat this horse to death or not. I think it's pretty dead. So I'm just going to I'm just going to um, go on. Okay. So I'm just going to I'm just going to go over a couple of these uh, these objective. No feelings, no, no psychology, just objective findings that, that uh, illustrate some of, some of these things that are changing in the brain. Okay, this was, a, this was a study done in China. This author, Yang, if you can see at the very end of that, short-term exposure to the violent video game, um, Yang, he or she, I don't know, is all over the place. When you look at this particular uh, subject of, of the detrimental effects of excessive screen time on kids. You, you can't get two or three in without finding another article from Yang. Uh, so, big name. Here. But what, what they did is they compared the violent video game group with controls. And, and they were able to do this exquisite neuroimaging that not only showed the structure of the brain, but what was being activated with the brain, so functional MRI. And what they found is that compared with the violent video game group, the controls had better activation of the prefrontal cortex. They had stronger connectivity between the prefrontal cortex and the anterior cingulate cortex, which is anterior cingulate is part of the limbic system. But this is the scary thing. The violent video game group showed that there was significantly more activity in the right amygdala. And again, the amygdala is part of that limbic system and less activations in the prefrontal cortex. So the video game is activating the limbic and it's deactivating the prefrontal. And if you remember back to that amygdala hijack slide, that's setting the brain up for that kind of a hijack. That is the explanation for that first tragic case of the fatal child abuse, is that father was in an amygdala hijack. This is another, uh, this is a, a different study. Um, this is a study, again, coming out of China, and we're going to talk about, what, about how interesting it is that most of these are coming out of China. Um, but this was looking at the, the gray matter volume um, in young adolescents with what is known as internet addiction disorder. So up here on the left, it shows 20, 25, 30, 35, 40, 45. That's how many months these um, kids have been addicted to the internet. Meaning, in order to be say that they're addicted to the internet, they have to be on it like five or six hours a day. Um, and what they found is that in these very important, front, mostly frontal lobe and prefrontal lobe, or prefrontal cortex structures, that the longer they were addicted to the internet, the more gray volume loss they saw on the MRI. So they were over pruning their brain. They're, instead of stopping, instead of selectively pruning their frontal cortex to where they could 
you, you know, still have a full life and a full understanding, the pendulum swung too far. And now they've lost many of these things because they were so focused on so few things that they over pruned their prefrontal cortex. It was thinner than it should have been. Um, and then another one in 2015. Um, and it's, it's, it's more of the same. This is an MRI study that examined the gray matter density and white matter density. So gray matter is where the, where the neurons talk to each other, and then the white matter is the neuron, is basically the wire that goes from the computer down to the rest of the brain. And this one was, what did they see changed in kids who had excessive internet video gaming? And same thing. They over pruned their frontal cortex. Um, they changed many of their limbic system structures. And the scary thing is, is what you're supposed to see when the brain uh, selectively prunes those prefrontal neurons, you see a decrease of the gray matter because you're, you're getting less of those dendrites, but you're supposed to get an increase in the white matter. You're supposed to get more myelination. They saw the opposite. They saw a decrease in the gray matter, and they also saw a decrease in the white matter. So they were, they were, they were losing too many neurons, I'm sorry, losing too many dendrites, and they were not um, reinforcing the surviving dendrites by increasing the white matter. And there's a few more studies that do this. I won't go over them. This is just kind of a list that I found. Um, each one of these is, again, a different song but the same story. And here's a few more studies. And here's a few more studies. All of these, same thing, same thing. Now, there recently, there is, uh, there's been a new study that I just want to touch on because this study is huge. This is called the ABCD study. Stands for Adolescent Brain Cognitive Development Study. This is a game changer because one of the problems that all these other studies have is they had um, numbers of 17, 20, 25, even 80. Those are good, but if you're going to get real statistical power, you've got to have lots of numbers. So this ABC uh, D study actually just got 300 plus million dollars of funding. It is enrolling 11,000 children from ages nine all the way through adolescence at 21 different sites, and it's completely standardized. And there is a multidisciplinary approach, and this, this is a very powerful study. And they just reported uh, some of the first science findings. So I'm just gonna talk about this really quick. This was their first report. So they, they have finally enrolled 4,277 kids, and they did what's called the cross-sectional portion, which means they they looked at where they were in this point in time. So remember, they enroll them at 9 and 10, so these are all 9 and 10-year-olds. And um, they, they found 132 factors that might explain why their brains were variable and why there was differences in their brains on the MRIs. Um, they found 10 factors that accounted for 37% of the variability, and four of those dealt with screen time. So, again, this was the first one. This, is, this study is going to take decades before it's complete. But what they did is they took these 4,277 9 and 10 year olds, they asked them all these questions, everything from their uh, parents' education, how many kids they have, where they grow up, what they eat, etc., etc. Um, like I said, over 132 different variables they looked at. And they are starting to find an association between screen time and brain changes. And then they went one further to see, well, do these brain changes have any statistical significance with psychopathology? Um, and here's what they're getting. This is a very busy slide, and I apologize for it. And I know you can't see any of this, so I'm gonna try and explain it. This, on this wheel, all of those are different brain structures, and I'll read some of these um, up here. You have, uh, Right uh, paracentral gyrus, right superior frontal gyrus, right frontal pole, okay? And what you see in those colors is the bigger the bar, 
then the more variable the brain structure is, um, and it has exceeded what is probably normal for variance in the brain structures. Uh, SMA stands for screen media uh, action or screen media addiction. Um, and so this particular chart is showing all of those brain structures in those purple and green bars are much more deviated from normal than they should be based on this group of children's screen use. Nine and ten. So even at nine and ten, they're finding significant changes in the anatomic brain structure just based on the factors from their brain use. And so they went further and they said, okay, can we link this to any, any, uh, any disorders? And what they found, so there, there were, like I said, I don't know if you remember, there were four factors, four factors that were all about screen time, and that's uh, GFA1, GFA2, GFA3, GF, GFA4. So what they found on the first one is, um, when we find these brain changes, what is the chance that we're going to see psychopathology? An internalizing psychopathology means suicidality, depression, anxiety. And 9 and 10, you can see that groups GFA1 and GFA4, if they're on the right side of that red line, meant they were more likely to have the psychopathology associated with those brain changes than what would be considered for average. Externalizing. Uh, psychopathology is considered aggressivity, um, sociopathy, lack of empathy. 